Good uh, morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome you to the LPC Rules Sprinkler Installations 2015 Incorporating BSC and 12845 webinar. This is a webinar on frequently asked questions following the recent updates that were published uh, earlier this year. I am Dale Kinnersley, I'm Principal Consultant and also Convener of Risk Authority Active Working Group who um, convenes the insurers that write the standards for the LPCB technical bulletins. And I shall be discussing this and hopefully um, answering questions that have been sent in from yourselves. The aim of this webinar is to provide you all with information on the recent editions. As I said, these came out in uh, early this year of 2019. So they are the LPC rules for automatic sprinkler installations incorporating BSEN 12845. The questions may have some relevance to 12845, but the majority of the questions that have come in are on the actual uh, LPC technical bulletin updates. So it's to answer frequently asked questions relating to these recent updates and also hopefully provide some background information relating to the updates. From this webinar, we expect it to run for approximately 45 uh, minutes. Questions and comments regarding the LPC rules can be emailed to technical at the fpa.co.uk at any time. The CPD itself is uh, the Chartered Insurance Institute accredited and any delegates participating in the webinar today uh, or any other um, FPA uh, risk authority webinars can claim 45 CPD minutes towards the uh, scheme. So I'm just going to run through a little bit <coughs> excuse me, of background information with regards to the development of the rules. So the rules were first published by the Fire Officers Committee in, 80, in London in 1888. Uh, this was then taken over by the LPC, which is the Loss Prevention Council, which is now the Fire Protection Association. We took over this function from the Fire Officers Committee. These rules were the basis of most standards and have evolved ever since their inception. So they started off as the Fire Officers Committee edition, 27th, 28th and 29th editions. These were then superseded by BS 5306 Part 2 in 1990. So the last edition of the Fire Officers Committee was the 29th edition. And in 1990, BS 5306 Part 2, um, inclusive of the LPC rules, came in and take, took over this. Up until 2003, when BSEN 12845 came out. And this run um, alongside BS 5306 until 2007, when BS 5306 was withdrawn. The current rules are the 2015 edition with the LPC uh, Technical Bulletins 2018. The standards are a model of uh, continuous improvement. So it's just a very mature example of com uh, continuous improvement combined with inherent simplicity of firefighting approach. And it's been proven to be a winning formula. So some of the bodies involved today, just for uh, avoiding confusion, SEN, which is the European Committee for Standardization, produced the EN 12845 by committee. The BSI, which is the British Standards Institution, adopts the, BSE, adopts the EN 12845 and makes it the BSEN 12845, and they've added a national forward and a national annex. And the FPA, which is the Fire Protection Association and Risk Authority, we published the LPC rules, and the LPC rules are the technical bulletins with input from the insurers and the sprinkler industry and other stakeholders. And these are based upon 12845 as a standard um, minimal document, uh, minimal standards document with the additional requirements, which is the technical bulletins, which is loss prevention and best practice. Uh, just to uh, overcome any other confusion, LPC rules are often understandably confused with the LPCB. The LPC is the Loss Prevention Council. The LPC rules are published by the FPA in association and funded through Risk Authority. 
The LPCB is the Loss Prevention Certification Board, which is a third party accreditation and certification body and part of BRE Global. So they are two separate entities. Improvement, the FPA and Risk Authority produced the LPC rules by improving and supplementing the requirements of the base document BSEN 12845. This has a significant technical contributions from the sprinkler industry and more importantly from the insurers. And these, these, these um, technical contributions are based on research, case study experience of real world fire events uh, and lessons learned and continuous improvement. So we're looking to improve the standards at all times uh, based on the requirements of the industry and the insurers. Risk Authority, just to give you a bit of a broad background, Risk Authority sits under the FPA and the remit of the group and the Sprinkler Working Group, which is the group that I convene that um, assists to pull together the uh, standards and develop the technical bulletins, is whenever, wherever possible, anticipate future events that may detrimentally impact upon the business of the UK insurance industry and invest accordingly to mitigate the consequences. Identify issues currently affecting the UK property insurance and invest accordingly to provide insurers with a means of managing the situation. Maintain and improve the industry guidelines, which is the LPC rules that underpin current insurer business and property protection practice. Make business and property protection financially and technically attractive to the insured property owner and act as a focal point for all stakeholders with interest in business and for property protection. So a question and answer session. It's been very um, interesting, some of the questions that have come in, and quite a few of them have been repeated. So I've taken on board the questions that uh, have come in, and we've um, put them into 13 uh, separate little areas. Some of them are repeated, but the repeats are different queries with regards to the same um, technical bulletin update that we received. So as you can see from there, air venting appears twice, uh, flushing appears twice. Um, but as I said, these, were, these are separate um, issues with regards to the same clause. So the, uh, the way we formatted this webinar is that we will pull up the, uh, the question first, then we will pull up the answer and just discuss them um, one by one. So, like I say, we'll start with um, question one, air venting, relating to technical bulletin TB229. So the question, a new requirement in TB229 2018 to vent air from grid and looped installations has appeared in TB229 3.22 and large parts of which have been repeated with differences at the end of TB229 3.15 flushing connections. Fair comment. TB229 clause 3.22 is an error and should therefore be ignored. And what we are aiming to do currently within risk authority is we are updating some of the technical bulletins with a view to releasing those towards the end of this year, start of next year, and clause 3.22 will be removed from the, um, as it was a publishing error. It was a repeat that I managed to get through, um, unfortunately, but the clause relating to this is actually TB229 3.15. And for those of you um, on, that are watching in, the correct uh, clause and commentary and recommendation is on the screen there and obviously all TVs when you're talking property protection with the insured replaces the British Standard Clause 15.6 and Annex D 3.3 so that was a nice easy simple one TB 229 3.22 is a mistake please ignore it do not use it use TB 229 3.15 I'm sorry that this is going so, but I think this slide may have got a little bit 
mixed up here. I will just bear with me one second. So with regards to um, flushing and air venting, um, question came in, what do other standards say? So NFPA 13 requires a single vent connection to vent a limited amount of air from wet installations and is intended to reduce the volume of air uh, in, in an installation to reduce the amount of corrosion and microbial activity. In addition, it is stated it is neither the intent nor practical to exhaust all trapped air from a single location on a wet spring system. Uh, an internet connection of uh, piping for venting purposes is not necessary. Multiple vent connections are especially, explicitly not required and a pressure relief valve is also required but related to solar heating and not venting. FM, on the other hand, requires a pressure relief valve related to solar heating but does not even raise the subject of installation venting. However, FM data sheet 2-1 confirms that removing trapped air from sprinkler spring systems um, via automatic air release valves or FM approved manual valves, which is what we brought in in TB229, automatic, uh, not automatic, manual valves to remove air each time the system is drained in similar to FM. So, um, with regards to technical bulletin updates, whilst changes and improvements to the LPC was not dependent on following other standards, such as we've just mentioned there, the question was raised, what do the other standards say about flushing and air venting? Um, with hydraulic calculations for gridded systems are based on water flowing in all pipes of the grid. So the requirements of the new or updated technical bulletins are not intended to be imposed retrospective on sprinkler contractors would not be expected to carry out such system improvements at their own costs. Uh, however, it may be on some high value risks insurers negotiate with some of their clients to make some system improvements retrospectively, but this will be proven to be by negotiation on existing systems. For newer systems, the requirement of TB229 3.15 should be adopted. Sorry, I got a, bit, a little bit confused on that. 3.15 uh, mentions flushing. It also discusses the venting of air from sprinkler systems. And the question was also raised, um, why are we doing it? The reason we're doing it is so that we can remove as much air for um, water to flow through all the pipe work. So as we can see in the diagram there at the, at the top, water does get trapped. Uh, water doesn't flow through all the ranges at all times. Air does get trapped in the system, hence the reason for venting. So for an example, in the case of a warehouse with a front and track, back, uh, track mains at ease level, with range, range pipes routed up and over the apex linking the two mains, the water supply at one end of the warehouse with the remote AMAO at the other end the ranges between the AMO and the water source will all be flowing water in the hydraulic calculations, or that's how the hydraulic package will um, uh, work, so that water flows through all the pipe works all the time. There will be no open heads on the ranges to expel the air, and the difference between the pressure at the front track compared to the pressure at the back track at the point of intersection of the ranges will be gradually less in the direction of the AMAO. These pressure differences will not be sufficient to move the air from the high point of the ranges so unlike theoretical hydraulic calculations, there will be no flow in the ranges. So basically what we're saying is a hydraulic calculation for a gridded system where you've got air trapped in it will not perform, a sprinkler system will not perform as per the hydraulic calculations with air trapped in the system, hence the reason to vent air from the system. So this is the reason why we're doing it. So the design and hydraulic efficiency of the system is based on the flow of water passing through all the pipes in the grid or in sections of distribution mains in looped pipe work configurations where trapped air can significantly restrict or prevent flow of water. The reason for venting uh, sprinkler systems. Hazard review. Questions that were sent in on hazard review. Could you advise whether you do any training courses on hazard review for sprinkler systems? What are the requirements for undertaking hazard reviews? Who should carry out hazard reviews? So hazard reviews for sprinkler systems are required in the LPC rules, clause 20, and they're also connect, uh, covered in technical bulletin TB203. 
So within the industry, it's assumed that providing a sprinkler installer can demonstrate competence with a recognized third party accreditation scheme. I've mentioned LPS 1048 or FIRAS or even IFC. Um, and they have the requisite the qualified personnel who attain the pass rate in the industry examinations, then they would have the experience and knowledge within the company to carry out a hazard review of the system in accordance with those clauses specified there. Hazard reviews are required on a quarterly basis, with the exception of what we will be coming to next. So, reviews are periodical, quarter, uh, quarterly and annually, of the existing system and its intended protection of the facility. Hazard reviews are not to be confused with yearly inspections, which are to be carried out by an independent company. So a hazard review should be carried out by a third party accredited sprinkler contractor that has a qualified engineer who's got, talking from the LPCB, the basic or and intermediate qualifications to do a review of the hazard to make sure that the system is adequate for the risk it is protecting. With regards to the yearly inspections, this was this was um, clause 21 of the uh, BSE N12845. Uh, sprinkler system shall be periodically inspected at least once a year by a third party. Um, this was then covered in technical bulletin TB203 clause 2.4, as you can see above, where it, it basically confirms the same. However, inspections should be undertaken by an independent third party, not the system owner, the building occupier, the system installer, or service and maintenance provider. That is contrary to what's currently being adopted out there in the industry. However, it should be an independent. Question three, high rise building protection. Uh, a fire consultant has confirmed he does not want to protect the toilets within a building designed to 12845 and LPC technical bulletins, Ordinary Hazard Group 3. A multi-stage system with an overall building height from basement to top of floor of 54 metres. Um, the, per the company that uh, sent the question in, our contractor stance is that due to the building being over 30 metres, and in order to fully comply with the LPC 12845, and technical bulletin TB206 clause, then the toilets would need to be fully sprinkled protected. Therefore, if the toilets aren't protected, this would be a deviation and needs to be noted on the certificate as such. <coughs> Excuse me. The consultant's response to the contractor stating those points there, I would quite robustly argue, even under the application of the LPC rules, that the contractor's interpretation is incorrect. They construed the table relating to occupancies where they cite plus 30 metres to trump the permitted exceptions, but intend to serve two different purposes. By an occupancy, the technical bulletins intend substantial rooms, usage areas, as the building's over 30 metres, the technical bulletins quite reasonably note we couldn't, for example, choose to earn sprinklers from one of the retail units. The permitted exceptions, however, are subspaces that are of a lesser risk and can be treated differently. This is not just our interpretation or the fire engineers on the development have concluded the same. Unfortunately, with regards to permitted exceptions, uh, TB206 Table 2 confirms uh, for an office block, and I will follow it through with the text now. On the basis of the occupancy of the building is essentially offices and is 54 metres high. The sprinkler system in question is being designed to 12845 plus technical bulletins to ordinary as group 3. And tend to provide both property protection and life safety, the contractor's interpretation of table 2B206, table, two table 2, is correct. Table TB206, table 2, takes cognizance of the fire resistances listed in the uh, Fire Design Guide for Protection of Buildings, which is the FPA Design Guide for Fire Protection of Buildings. It's a separate document uh, which is mentioned in the table. Um, other aspects were considered in determining specific fire resistances and outlined uh, in, ta in Table 2. And without attempting to list all the considerations here, aspects such as the following for just some factors taken into account. So when the TB was updated and they looked at heights of buildings, etc., um, and we also re re um, 
used the FPA design guide for fire protection of buildings. We took into other accounts, such as the fire and rescue safe, safe, safe intervention to extinguish fires in non sprint protected parts of buildings over 30 metres. And obviously, in the context of one above, similar considerations, the cost benefit analysis of sprint protecting areas of permitted exceptions, such as toilets, where sprint protection is provided throughout the rest of the building, would therefore involve the relatively minor additional cost of installing pipe work and sprinkle heads to what are typically relatively small areas. So that was the that was the reason for table two. And as a result, table two does not allow the permitted exceptions in office buildings over 30 metres high. Hence the final paragraph of the clause uh, 4.2.1 refers users to the overriding conditions detailed in the table. There's the table. Um, so building type three, occupancy type three, offices, um, ground or upper, greater than 30 metres at the bottom, not permitted, highlighted there, which means if it says not permitted, it means sprinkler protection has got to be installed over 30 metres for an office block, irrespective of what the actual rooms are used for. So permitted and necessary exceptions um, um, do not apply on buildings over 30 metres, office blocks. Next question that came in was related to school sprinkler protection, and in particular, protection of voids. So the question, can you please clarify the core following? So we see there TB221F1, the example, which is the uh, scenario A, sprinklers in the void are not, not required. Scenario A does not set an upper limit for the depth of void. So voids over 800 that are made of non-combustible construction and do not contain combustible con contents do not require protection. TB221F1 overrides TB230, please confirm. So for confirmation, TB221.1 states within the last sentence that this technical bulletin takes precedence over any other requirements of the LPC rules. However, it does only qualify this for the protection of schools and TB230 is not specifically related to schools. So if it is a school building, you do not need to apply TB230, you need to apply TB221. So the intent of scenario A is not to sprinkle protect voids constructed of non-combustible and containing no combustibles, even if they exceed 800 mil in depth as defined in TB230. So in addition to that, optional exceptions is qualified by TB221 3.1, which states that all exceptions to sprinkler protection shall be agreed with the insurers and the authority having jurisdictions. Therefore, the insurers and the authority having jurisdictions can consider all the factors and issues related to the voids, which TB221 cannot hope to define and should always be based on project by project basis. The challenge is to establish the non-combustible aspect relating to the voids at the construction and post-construction stage so that the insurers and the authorities having jurisdiction are satisfied and can conclusively decide on the protection or non-protection as they see fit. Um, what I will say with relation to these, some of these um, questions that we've had is these answers have been sent direct to the people who have um, sent the questions in. So thank you very much for the questions for those who've sent in. Uh, question five, control valve sets or control valve set in relation to Annex F. So this is more of a BSEN 12845 question rather than an LPC, but then it's also covered in TB232. Can you please clarify TB232.1 and TB232.5 commentary and recommendation? Point one states that the technical bulletin specifies the requirements for installation control valve sets other than for Annex F. So requirement other than the old life safety. But the commentary and recommendation states that a single installation control valve set will not be permissible for installations which are designed to comply with Annex F. A bit of a contradiction. So the client who, uh, the question that come in, we assume that uh, the commentary and recommendation is saying that you can't have a single installation control valve set with bypass for Annex A, and that you must have duplicate valve sets as per TB232 figure two. This point we would like clarification of. I think that's supposed to say Annex F. 
not Annex A. So for installations to comply with Annex F, which was the old life safety, as many of you will know, they will be required to be duplicate installation valves. So if it's to comply with Annex F, you cannot have a bypass on the wet installation control valve. It must be a duplicate. The reason is a bypass valve would not have the facilities to be fully operation in all aspects as listed below. So if you look at clause 5.5 there, it does state, and I've underlined it, the sprinkler installation shall be operational in all aspects. And a bypass will not give you that um, facility to have all um, facilities operational. So um, for Annex F, it must be duplicate. Um, and there, the commentary and recommendation, a single installation control valve will not be permissible for which are designed. Uh, I'll put a little note there, perhaps the wording on the CNR on TB232.5 should note bypass. So maybe something that we um, pick up and adopt when we do the technical bulletin updates later in the year. Retrospective rules application. I think this was a pretty straightforward question. So what are the expectations for sprinkler systems that were designed and installed before new changes regarding design approach where there is ex excessive roof stroke ceiling clearance. Should protection be enhanced, upgraded retrospectively? So the answer is that it is not a requirement to retrospectively apply new standards to existing systems. However, the application of additional discharge density for excessive clearance was already part of the LPC requirements prior to the new technical bulletins. So this was already a requirement under TB234 to enhance the density at the roof level for excessive clearances from stock to sprinkler, permitted, uh, permitted storage heights, not actual storage heights of over four meters. So that was, the, that was just clarified in the last technical bulletin TB234. However, as I've noted there, some high value risks insurers might wish to negotiate with some of their clients to make system improvements retrospectively but this would be by negotiation on existing systems. So we're not saying to contractors, you must go back and change this if you've got five meter um, excessive clearance. However, the insurers may ask if they can enhance the sprinkler system from whatever density it is designed to produce to enhance the density to cover the additional clearance. And obviously any new sprinkler system that has recently been designed since the um, since the um, technical bulletins were issued to industry, um, should adopt TB234 4.2. So you must increase the density based on your knowledge of the permitted stock levels, which feeds quite nicely on to question seven, which is the increased design design density. So the question is, what is the reason for the increase in design density for excessive roof heights above storage? Is this based on fire testing and is it proven? This is a very, very good question. Unfortunately, fire test evidence investigating the phenomena is limited due to cost and complexity of undertaking test, testing at the scale and severity. However, work is going on in this area. The LPC, uh, not the LPC, the FPA um, are not conducting any of these tests at this moment in time. However, we, are, we do believe that work is ongoing in this area. So current evidence that has been available, which is what was used to confirm the additional discharge density, demonstrates that increasing water discharge rates with uniform distribution and large water droplets are helpful for firefighting in these circumstances. Uh, and adopting this option, all stakeholders should be consulted with their with their agreement sought. And unfortunately, there is no probably fully proven design solution for this problem at this moment in time. Uh, one of the biggest questions that was asked during the um, webinar that was done earlier in the year with re regarding the um, increase in density is if the increase in density goes over 15 mm to say 17 and a half, and the fire area then in the table states 260 square meters AMAO and then goes to 300, do we increase the uh, fire area? The answer is no. The only 
dense, the only increase is with regards to the density. So you could go up to 25 mil a minute uh, density over the stored goods over an area of 260 square meters. Question eight is a relation to LPC, BSE and 12845 rules. So are there any plans to update EN 12845 rules? Uh, they are not written well, well written and could be much more informative. Well, I can tell you that BSE and 1285 is currently under revision and being rewritten as a standard. A major change um, is coming. Um, it's being developed by SEN, which we mentioned earlier on in the slide, which is the European Committee for Standardization. They will produce the EN 12845 bit by committee. Uh, BSI again, the British Standards Institute, they will adopt the BS part of it and add the National Forward and National Annex. The due date for this updated standard is currently unknown. It is currently being um, written. However, there will be a full review by risk authority in the FPA with the LPC technical bulletins revisions following the issue of this standard. So when this new BSEN 12845 comes out in the future, the technical bulletins will need to be rewritten and adopted to meet the requirements of BSEN 12845. So there will be a major change coming in the future. We don't have the dates yet are from the committee that are writing the new standard when these will be available. Some of the documents are currently out for um, comment. However, um, no plan date for issue yet. Air venting. Again, we mentioned this earlier. This is another question relating to air venting. Confirmation that all ranges on a gridded or loop system or systems need to be vented. Do ranges that are installed level always re also require venting? So in answer to that, the requirement of both FM Global and NFPA is to install automatic air vents to increase the longevity of the pipework by removing trapped air that contributes to the accelerated corrosion of the pipework irrespective of the pipework configuration. So the other international standards that are used in the UK um, want automatic air vents purely for to keep the longevity of a sprinkler system intact, i.e. reduce the amount of corrosion of sprinkler pipework, which, which, which um, leads to leaks on the system. However, risk authority uh, introduced TB229 3.15 manual air venting for two reasons. So reason one was to remove air from the system to assist flow of water through all pipes uh, gridded and, especially gridded and loop systems as designed by contractors undertaking full hydraulic calculations and to remove air oxygen from the system to reduce corrosion rates. So it was twofold. So it is therefore assumed that all future sprinkler installations, irrespective of pipe configuration, sloped or level pipe installations will have the facility to remove as much air as possible from the sprinkler system. So the answer is yes. The answer to the question is all systems will need to be vented. Um, new technical bulletin that was introduced earlier in the year was technical bulletin TV237, which is flushing of underground pipe work. And there was quite a few questions um, relating to this. So um, as question 10, this may have more than one question on it. So the first one is if water supplies are not capable of providing the flow rates for flushing, can the full flow of the available water supply be used and accepted? Which is a reasonable question. So the technical bulletin confirms the following where flow rates from table one cannot be achieved. So as there, TB237, clause 3.7, if the water supply is not capable of delivering the relevant flushing flow rate, um, the underground trunk main may be flushed at a flow rate equivalent to, and it mentions there uh, the system design uh, maximum flow demand capacity, um, which is Qmax, or in the case of pre-calculated systems, basically what's in table six or table TB210, table five. Um, alternatively, if you cannot achieve any of these flow rates, then obviously you will have to flush the system at what maximum flow is available at that particular time. And should it not meet the requirements of this clause, then it needs to be documented in detail down. Uh, at the back of TB237, there was a um, flushing certificate template for contractors to use. Uh, and I would 
assume that they would put the flow rates applicable at the time of flushing, uh, document it on this and submit it to the authorities having jurisdiction and the insurers to confirm what the flow rates they did flush the system through at. Deluge systems, question 10. Well, 12.845 or the LPC rules ever address deluge system design? <coughs> Excuse me. Currently, there are no plans to include deluge systems in the LPC technical bulletins. With regards to BSEN 12845, I don't believe I've read it yet uh, in the current updated or the document that's currently being updated that deluge systems are in there. So um, if it's not in BSEN 12845, it's more than likely not going to be referenced in the LPC technical bulletins. Flushing. Again, question. We all know that debris can be ingested into below ground sprinkler pipe work. If the, pipe, if the installation is sloppy and insufficient precautions are taken to prevent it, this applies equally to sprinkler installers and water authority contractors. Question, why wait until now to introduce it? Has there been recent evidence of serious impairment? So, the technical bulletin was raised because the insurers felt there was a need, which is obviously, or presumably, from what they were finding out in the field when they were doing their commissioning tests, uh, and normal engineering good practice, which should be adopted in terms of flushing underground mains prior to burying, was clearly not always being carried out as a matter of course. So this is right why the insurers felt it was needed. So the creation of this new technical bulletin, which came out early this year, was welcomed by BRE, LPCB, FireAss and BAFSA, because they were all consulted during the drafting phase. Um, so whilst we agree it has been well overdue, we don't believe there was any evidence of more pressing need to produce it now, particularly it's just that it was just recently brought in. Do you have any confidence that insurers will require this flushing to be undertaken by the insured? Um, so, within the risk authority group, insurer members, uh, they were one of the bodies who felt the need for this technical bulletin. Uh, and while this doesn't mean each and every insurer will always insist on flushing, we expect most of them will, uh, unless there's project specific compelling reason not to uh, do the flushing. Again, this is not for uh, this standard to try and address such cases. So, yes, we would expect the majority of insurers, especially as the um, technical bulletin was um, required by the insurers as an issue that they were finding out in the field, to insist that underground uh, pipes are flushed. Do you think that a sprinkler do you think that sprinkler service companies will be able to convince their clients to carry out immediate and then regular flushing of existing main pipes as required in table two, bearing in mind the high cost disruption to the client's operation, isolation of the sprinkler installations whilst the T valve and flow meter are all installed and the test is carried out, and problems involving this disposal of water, which is a fair question that's been raised. And we would answer that. We do not think that this is a matter uh, for a standard on good practice to necessarily be influenced by what the system owner might want to do. Obviously, there's a compelling argument to flush the mains immediately if there's evidence of debris being flushed into the installation or the existing main is modified or if the flow rates through the main are deteriorating due to debris. So irrespective whether the client or, or the sprinkler contractor's client or system owner doesn't want this to happen for um, fear of flooding a particular facility or the impairment of having a system offline. Um, if there is evidence that there is debris in the installation, then it's a requirement of the standard to flush the pipes through. So system owners might take issue with the need for flushing solely because there is no evidence in the main in question have not been previously flushed, but this does not mean flushing is not necessary under these circumstances. And surely the technical bulletin will assist the sprinkler service companies to explain the need to system owners. So we would assume that as a sprinkler contractor, you explain this reason to your um, clients, discuss this with them and find the best way of uh, overcoming the situation with regards to potential problems with regards to flushing of the sprinkler mains. However, come up with some form of um, kind, um, plan to do this safely um, and in conjunction with the authorities having jurisdiction, make sure that the, this is done in accordance with the standard. 
obviously TB237 on all new installations um, from the release of the technical bulletin, this facility should be there and should be done at the beginning of the job. Coming on to one of our uh, last questions here on TB229 flushing again, which is not TB237 flushing, this is flushing of sprinkler systems. Question, this has replaced Annex D, the old Annex D 20 mil flushing valve, or better described as a test valve at the remote end of a zone, which was to be used for the testing of a continuity of pipe work and the zonal installation control valve and pump alarms after a zone had work carried out has been replaced by the flushing valve at the ends of the distribution pipe spurs. This confuses two different operations, testing alarms and flushing debris from the pipe work. Surely there is a need for both. A 40 mil flushing valve will not simulate the flow through a single sprinkler as the 20 mil valve would have done so is an unrealistic test of the alarms. Does it mean that the end of line zone testing is no longer required to prove the integrity of the connection and the various alarms? Fair question. So, the clause does replace clause D point, uh, well, Annex D, clause 3.3, but it does not replace Annex D, clause 3.5, which deals with the test facility mentioned. So bearing in mind, if parties are using the 20 mil flushing valve for this alarm test, this is not replicating the effects of a single sprinkler opening, so is and was not compliant in the first place. Uh, in answer to concerns replacing uh, Annex D Clause 3.3 with the requirements of uh, I think there's a 229 3.15 does not confuse two different operations. It keeps them separate. As stated, there is a need for both. So the zone testing is still required to prove the integrity of the connection and the various alarms. And what the amendment should do is highlight that the flushing valve should not be used for testing the alarm facilities, even though it has always been incorrect to do so. Another, are you, uh, with the same question on flushing, are you expecting insurers to require that all the air release valves are fitted to all of the client's looped and gridded installations? Answer, yes. In the case of gridded systems, we would expect insurers to require this air release improvement to be adopted. It's as simple as that. And we would also expect any sprinkler designer to adopt the air venting in line with this technical bulletin as a matter of course from now on. So when it was issued as a standard earlier in the year, um, there is an implementation date. So all new sprinkler designs for each installation should have the facilities to manually vent air to remove as much trapped air as possible from the system. Again, twofold. One, to improve hydraulic efficiency in the pipe work, flow of water in, in comparison to trapped air, uh, trapped sections of pipe with air. And two, to uh, prolong the life of the, uh, the in an integrity of the sprinkler pipe work from corrosion rates. So final words, as we've gone through all the questions that came in, this, this webinar may have been cut a little bit short, but final words for those of you who have taken time in to send your questions and queries, many thanks for those uh, questions that have come in. If anybody has any further questions, uh, we would be more than happy to answer these. Any comments and proposals regarding the LPC rules from the industry as well can also be submitted to us any time on the email below. So anything you have with regards to the webinar, any questions that you have, with, in relation to the LPC technical bulletins, please email us at the technical at, technical at the fpa.co.uk. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out now with regards to the LP sprinkler rules, we have just released, um, which is now available, the PDF online version edition of the uh, sprinkler rules. Um, so it was in response to growing consumer demand for an electronic version accessible offline. It works by locking the PDF to a device on, in its first opening. Um, if you have one license, the document can be, or the PDF document can be installed on two devices, and the file cannot be decrypted if forwarded to other recipients or local servers. So once it's uh, locked in on, onto your system, i.e. laptop or desktop or laptop and iPad, it is locked there, it can't be forwarded. It works on all modern platforms, portable devices and browsers and it has the ability to print pages, mark up documents with sticky notes. It is a fully interactive document. Every table um, 
is highlighted every section every clause is highlighted it will take you to that clause it will take you back it will take you to tv tvs um fully interactive document um which should save time and, and paper um just to go through what the learning outcomes of today were it was just a reminder that today's webinar should have provided the information to the recent editions of the lpc rules again it won't have given covered everything, it has only covered the questions that were sent in, so thank you again for those that have sent the questions in. Um, these are the frequently asked questions relating to the updates that we've answered, and to provide a bit of background information relating to the updates, which again, the updates are all developed through risk authority with uh, major contributions from the insurers who are uh, members of the risk authority, active working group. And finally, if you want a copy of any LPC rules, please contact sales at the fpa.co.uk or contact us on the above number. Any technical questions to that? Thank you very much for listening. Enjoy the rest of your day.